following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. And uh, Elohim, Jehovah Elohim, took Eve, one of his sides, This is an account of the generations of Adam in the day that Elohim created Adam in the likeness of Elohim made they Adam. Male and female created they them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. This lecture is a continuation of the former one in which we were explaining the seventh uh, day of Genesis. Let us uh, uh, read uh, the second graphic, or to observe the second graphic in order to understand uh, what we had to explain because we associate as the Zohar does Moses with uh, Adam and Israel who is Jacob and of course uh, Moses is the main personage in our lectures since he represents willpower, the force that is developed in different stages until it uh, achieves the union with the divine. And uh, that's why the book of Zohar explains that what we, uh, the last verse in which we left the lecture, the previous lecture, and where we said, and Jehovah Elohim planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there they put Adam, who they had formed. The Zohar states that uh, this section uses a story to expand upon the previous section of the seven days. God elevates Adam from the lower worlds with his or we put there, there, because in reality is male and female, with their evil and negativity to upper worlds, where Adam is placed in the Garden of Eden. This story mirrors our own spiritual work. The spiritual forces 
of the Zohar, which also means fire, because Zohar means brightness, related with light. But also, if you look for the different meanings of Zohar, you find that also means fire, because it cannot be any light or brightness without fire. And this is the main topic in this lecture, to put emphasis in fire, since this is precisely the element that we use. So the fire gives us the strength to draw the light of the Creator to assist us in our elevation above the negative influences of our physical existence. Through the power of this section, we gain a deeper connection to the upper worlds the section that we are going to explain, <clears throat> which of course relates to the taking of Eve, the feminine aspect of divinity, in order to make the separation of sexes. And this is precisely a profound uh, topic because relates to the element fire and uh, most of the time, people just identify with it in relation with the physical plane, with the physical body, but relates to different levels of, what, of that which we call Adam. Remember that uh, in previous lectures, we explain that Israel is that image that is formed in the world of Yehida, or in that soul which is called Yehida. The world Yehida is a world that means unity. You can write Yehida with the letter He or the letter Het. Neither way, we always say, means unity. Because Yehi, according to the Zohar, is that word that is very often repeated in Genesis. And Yehi means divine light. So when we said Yehida, spelled with he, we relate also to that unity which is commonly related with uh, the army. If you look in the website, you will find always Yehida related with the army forces of different countries, especially in this day and age, Israel. But how do we explain this? And it is because in previous lecture we explained that Yod, Hey, Bab, Hey, which is translated as Jehovah in the Bible, is that unity that is a force, a fire, a light diluted in the space, in the universe. If the people think that this yod he vav he relates only to a particular religion in this planet, they are wrong. Because Kabbalah belongs to the universe. Kabbalah is a science that is uh, related to space, to the cosmos. And that's why that uh, holy name, yod he vav he relates always, we repeat, to the Ein Sof, to that invisible, unlimited force which is represented by the space. When we see the space in the night, we see darkness. But indeed, there is light. A light that we see as darkness because it's so strong that our physical sight cannot endure it or see it. So we see it as darkness. That's the Ein Sof. From that Ein Sof emerges 
the Holy Trinity, which is called in different religions with different names. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Christianity, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva in Hinduism, Keter, Chokma, Bina in the Tree of Life, the first triangle. So these three sephiroths with the Ain Saf, the limitless space, are forming the four letters of the holy name of God, which is Yod He Bab He, and that forms that unity that we call Yehida. So Yehida is light, but is the light of the light. And uh, that light is precisely what uh, in the Zohar explains is the Zohar, the brightness of the fire. Within that Zohar, or that fire, or that or light is precisely where we find the archetypes that we name Israel. When we address Israel, we are addressing all of those archetypes that relate to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, to the Sephiroth, and all of those fires that are within Yehida, forming what we call the army of the voice, of that which in esoteric terms we call the Teomertmalogos, which is that force that contains all the forces of the voice, the Logos, the word. Remember that John states in his Gospels, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the beginning with God, Bereshith. There is a light that hides the omnipresence of that which is unknowable, the absolute. Within that Yehida is where we find what we call the Messiah. The Messiah is that part of that soul, Yehida, that periodically descends not only in the planet Earth but in any planet and takes the human form in order to guide that particular humanity or that particular planet when that force decides to incarnate in order to open the doors of the light. Messiah means anointed one. In other words, there may be a soul, a human soul that is prepared in order to receive that Messiah. And this is precisely what we are explaining here. The way in which we develop the soul, the consciousness, in order for us to be prepared to receive that Messiah within. Now, when we pronounce Yehida, it comes into my mind also this other word from the Hebrew language, Yehuda. 
The only difference between Yehida and Yehuda is the letter Vav. In Yehida, you find the letter Yod within the unknowable divine. But when that light descends into the world of creation, that letter Bab is extended and becomes the letter, I mean, the letter Yod is extended and becomes the letter Vav. Remember that the letter Vav is a symbol of the tree of life, the spinal column, the spinal medulla. So the light of Yehida descending into the spinal medulla is forming what we call Yehuda. So that Yehuda is precisely what we call Judah in English. This is how you say it in, in Hebrew, Yehuda, Judah. And from Judah comes the word Jew. You find the book of Revelation and uh, in two chapters, the statement, those who call themselves Jews and they are liars because they are not. So in order to explain and to understand what is to be a Jew or a Yehuda, we have to understand what is Yehida. Because Yehida is an army of forces that in the Bible are called Israel. And by descending into the world of creation, they become Yehuda. In the Bible, you find that Judah, Yehuda, is associated with the lion. Among the 12 tribes of Israel, the lion represents Leo, the constellation of Leo, which is the house of the sun, S-U-N. So the solar light is the house of Yehuda. And that's why the sun, S-U-N, is in the very center of the tree of life. Precisely ruling Tifereth, which is a human soul. And that's why when you study the Zohar, you find that Tifereth is associated with the sun, with the solar light, and is associated with Israel. Israel, of course, is the same Jacob, the patriarch Jacob in the Bible. And uh, the patriarch Jacob in the Bible received the force, of course, of Jehida. That's why you find how the Lord, yod heh vav is associated with Yehuda and with Tifereth, Israel, and at the same time with Moses, who is the one that represents willpower, that develops little by little, in the psychology, in physiology of any human being that is performing the work that we are explaining here. So, in the world of Yehida, where we find the Messiah, you find many souls. We will say many initiates that in previous cosmic days became one with the army of the voice. That's why you find in this planet Earth different religions founded by these individuals that descended periodically from that world of Yehida 
in order to establish the doctrine in different levels. We have taken from the Bhagavad Gita the graphic that relates to the Lord Krishna. If you see the second graphic, we wrote a verse of the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 2 and 3, where we read, Jodhava, or Jehovah, is my strength and song, and he has become my Yeshua. Now, observe that we wrote Yeshua from the Kabbalistic point of view. We inserted the letter Shin, which is fire, symbol of fire, in the name, the second name of God, yod heh vav -He, which represents Yehida. By putting that Shin in that word, we form the word Yeshua. Why? Because the letter Shin represents Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and also our monad, which is called Adman Buri Manas, or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Bible. When somebody has created that sheen, that fire in his own monad, then the Lord, which is the Messiah, descends and becomes Yeshua which in Hebrew means Savior. And that's why the verse continues. This is my Elohim, and I will praise him, my Father's God. Who is my Father's God? We're not talking here about our physical Father, but our monad, our inner Father is, of course, has said Abraham inside of us. So the God of my father is Yehida, is the Christ, is that Avalokiteshvara, and that receives many names as well as Kuan Yin in Taoism. So it says, and I will exalt him. How do you will exalt or how somebody will exalt that force of Yehida inside? By working initiatically, psychologically within themselves. And that's why the other verse says, Jehovah is a man of war. Jehovah, his name in Hebrew is written, yod he bav -He is a shin of war. yod he bav -He is his name. Now you find here the word shin that relates to men. Because in Hebrew, you pronounce the word man in different ways. Adam is man, but this Adam represents the perfect man made into the image of God. Now, Ish represents also the process of the fire that descends from above within the initiate. And that's why it is, it is written there, Jehovah is an Ish, or yod he -he is Ish, which means fire. Because if you take the letter Yod, which is between Aleph and Shin, you form the word Esh, which means fire. And the letter Yod represents always the male active force, willpower of God. So when we said Ish, we are acting, we are referring to the willpower, fiery willpower of God in the man. Or in the one, in other words, who is performing that war. 
That war in the in India is called the Mahabharata, the great work. In the Bible, in the Quran, is written in different levels, and according to, to to that tradition, there is always war that we call holy war. Holy war has nothing to do with the physical plane. Holy war is something that you do, you perform inside. That's why, behold here, the graphic of the Mahabharata, in which Arjuna, which in the Bible represents Moses, is in front of Krishna, which in this case is the Messiah, or Yeshua in Hinduism, that descends in order to help him to do the work. Arjuna is the Bodhisattva. Moses is also the Bodhisattva that do the work, represents willpower. And uh, when Arjuna is asking Krishna, show me your universal form. And then behind Krishna appears Vishnu, that represents the Christ, the Logos. And behind him, different trillions of faces that represent Every single individual that achieve the union with Yehida, with the army of the boys, not only in this planet, but in all the planets of the universe. And that's why, that's the beauty of it. When you penetrate in Samadhi into the world of Yehida, that's universal soul, and you concentrate only in one particular being, you become that being. If you concentrate in Krishna, you become Krishna. If you concentrate in Jesus, you become Jesus. If you concentrate in Moses, you become Moses. If you concentrate in Mohammed, you become Mohammed. I mean, you, your consciousness becomes diluted in that individual who is one with the rest. So in the world of Yeshua, the Messiah, there is not individuality. It was we call the multiple perfect unity. And that is what in Kabbalah is pronounced Yod, He, Vav, He. So among all of those individuals, that belongs to Yehida, you find Samael on the or, who is the head of this Gnostic movement, of this school that we are in which we are spreading the knowledge. But of course, not only him belongs to Yehida, many masters. But it happens that in this day and age, he is responsible to deliver the light of Yehida to humanity. So, every single individual of that light is called a Jew. When you write Jew, you find that you write it Yod, He, and Vav. With three letters. This is how you write the word Jew. Yod He Vav, which are related, of course, to the holy name of God. Yod He Vav, Jew, means an individual that developed the three primary forces of the holy name within. So, in this planet Earth, the one who represents the light of Yehida is the master Aberamento. And this is something that we have to understand. Because he is the boss of the White Lodge. What is the White Lodge? The White Lodge is represented by all of those individuals who self-realize that light within them. 
And those are what we call Jews, or what the Bible calls the Jews, because they have the light of Yehuda within. And that's why Jesus of Nazareth, the master of Eramento, that's his name, that incarnated 2,000 years ago and came to the planet in order to help this humanity, is called the king of the Jews. Because he is the head. So, this is what we have to understand. That among all of those great masters that belongs to the army of the voice in the world of Yehida, Yeshua, Averamento, Jesus of Nazareth, is at the top of the pyramid. He's the most exalted among them. So all of them have to follow the rules or the commands of the master Averamento named in this planet, Jesus of Nazareth. And that's why Master Samael on Veor was receiving orders from the master Averamento, and he still is receiving orders from the master Averamento because he is the boss of Yehida. And that's why he is called the Messiah, because he represents the light of Yehida. It's not that he is the only Messiah, because the Messiah is that soul that enters into that person who is prepared in order to perform the Mahabharata, the great work inside. And this is precisely what we call Yahovah is an Ish. Of war. This is what Moses wrote in Exodus. Doesn't mean that it is those ridiculous words that we are having here in this physical plane. When we go and kill our brothers and sisters for different circumstances. The war that we are talking here is a war that we have to wa to to wage. Right? against our own defects and vices. And this is precisely what we have to understand. So all the process of this war is explained in the book of Genesis, in many books of the Bible, as well in the Quran, as well in the Mahabharata. You read also the Popol Vuh of the Mayans, you find also wars there, killings, etc. But refers as in Greek and Roman mythology, the works or the work that God is doing inside of us against all of those mythological monsters that are the symbol of that that we have within very alive. So that is in relation, of course, with the name Jehuda or Jew when we are naming and also Israel, because Israel is precisely all the archetypes that descend from that world of Yehida, and that we had to develop. And uh, in previous lecture, we explained that Moses is the one that developed that in different stages, and that we are explaining uh, to different lectures. Now, let us go into the next graphic. Which we find the Tara, the white Tara from uh, Tibet, which is the symbol, of course, of the forces that are developing inside of us as male-female in the Garden of Eden. Remember that the book of Genesis states in the seventh day that Jehovah Elohim 
took Adam and placed it into the Garden of Eden in order to have control of it, to master it. The Zohar asks, from where did Jehovah Elohim take Adam and place it in the Garden of Eden? The answer is, he takes Adam from the four elements. The four elements that represents, of course, yod he bar he The four elements which are in, in our physicality that we have to master. Because when somebody masters the element fire, water, air, and earth, he is an Adam who is a king of nature. Remember, Adam, king of nature, doesn't mean the, what the people in this day and age think. That refers to us because we are destroying nature. That we have the capacity of polluting the air or polluting the waters, destroying the forests, and doing experiments with animals and plants. And therefore, we do that because we are the king of nature. We are Adam. No, we are not Adam. Adam represents that individual that cons controls the tatwas, the forces of the elements. And that is not a slave of nature. So therefore, when Jehovah Elohim takes Adam for the four elements, means that he formed Adam already, a king of nature, and placed it into the fourth dimension, which is Yesod, in order, in order to to put it into the fourth dimension, which is called the promised land. Now, this promised land, which is called in the Bible Eden, is formed according to the rules, according to the, the, the sample of above. In many lectures we explain there are two paradises or two Edens. The first one is above in the superior worlds. That paradise where we find God ruling as Adam and Eve. And that God, Jehovah Elohim, forms a terrestrial garden. When we call terrestrial garden means a paradise made in the superior worlds. We are not referring to the three-dimensional world called Malkut. That paradise that this uh, verse of Genesis states where God places Adam is located in the fourth dimension. That is the promised land that we enter when we conquer, when we perform all the tasks that Moses performs in the book of Exodus. That is something that we have to do inside. By doing it, by following the rules that we already explained, finally Moses enters into the promised land after passing the process that we explained. There in the promised land, in that physical body that is immortal, that we said is resurrected, is where Jehovah Elohim makes to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. 
Imagine the four dimension, the promised land, and that individual already a master of nature. And that body that he or she receives, which is immortal, is what the Bible calls tree that is pleasant to the sight. A physicality that is not our, like our physicality, but whose flesh is transparent. A flesh, we will say, that is like a glass that reflects the light of Yehida within. Remember that Adam is, Adam is made into the image of God. So that light reflects there. So his flesh is pure light. Every tree, as you remember in the previous lecture, we said that when Moses saw God, he saw God in the burning bush as fire. So as fire, God appears in front of Willpower, Moses. And when Moses descended, he descended from the Mount of Sinai, it is written that his flesh was glowing because he has started in the process of transformation. So when somebody enters into the fourth dimension with their resurrected body, it's a tree. Pleasant to the sight. A burning bush. Pleasant to the sight. Doesn't mean that it's burning. But that light, that fire is glowing inside and outside of him. And of course. And good for food. Because the light of Yehida is the fire, the light, the life. That is the center of the universe and that feeds all the powers, the cities, the senses, the consciousness and that gives comprehension and understanding of the universe inside of that brain that that individual has developed 100%. Not like us, that we have like maybe as much, 10, I, I believe. But the individual of this level has 100% of his brain active. And of course, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. <coughs> that means that he, in his spinal column, in his spinal medulla, are all the tree of life, all the sephiroth, completely self-realized and connected to his consciousness. Imagine that individual that in the spinal column has that fire and it gives that power to him. And of course also the tree of knowledge of good and evil that refers to the sexual power. That relates with the same roots. Because the tree of life and the tree of good and evil have or they share the same roots. Which is the sexual force. It means that that individual is an Elohim and physical body. An Elohim. Remember what the Zohar says. An Elohim, a God, translated in the Bible as God, is, is written Elohim because it means male, female, or good and evil. It's an individual that extracted the wisdom of evil 
from the very bottom and make of that evil something good by annihilating defects, vices, and errors which were the outcome of that evilness and transforming that into good. When you transform evil into good, that good is good to the sight of God, but has the knowledge of evil. Because you took the light that was trapped into sin. But the one that that or performed that transformation is the Messiah within you. Only the Messiah can transform that evil into good, which in the previous lecture we told you, is that human soul sank into sin, which is called Mary Magdalene, from which the Lord takes the seven capital sins and transforms that prostitute into a holy soul. That's the representation of us. Because the soul is always feminine. The soul is that prostitute that is very alive in each one of us. But if we take, if the Lord, if we allow the Lord to take that seven sins, or those seven sins, out of us, then that whore, that prostitute, will become holy. And that union, or that symbiosis, of the Messiah with Mary Magdalene, or, the, or we will say the soul of Yehida with Nefesh, which is the animal soul, that mixture elaborates Neshama in a higher level, which is, of course, the spiritual soul. And that union makes the solar man that appears in the promised land, in the fourth dimension, in the Garden of Eden, and becomes a soldier of the army of the voice, a soldier of Yehida. Those soldiers appear often in this planet in order to guide humanity. As I said, Abraham is one soldier. Moses is another one. Krishna is another one. Rama is another one. Kuan Yin. Jesus of Nazareth. And the last soldier from that Yehida that appeared and gave this knowledge, Samael on the or. But I repeat, that army of the voice, Yehida, has millions of soldiers. They form the guardian wall that always are taking care of the souls of this planet Earth. Let us continue explaining in the Zohar. It is written that uh, Ravi Eleazar, who in the Zohar is the son of Ravi Shimon Bar Hohai, he asked, who has connected the doings of Adam to the activities, activities of Israel and Moses? His father, Ravi Shimon, replied, My son, how can you ask such a thing? Have, have you not learned declaring the hiddenmost from the beginning? From Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10. Then Rabbi Eleazar, his son, says, It is indeed so. So, declaring the hindermost from the beginning means to unveiling 
the back, the tree of life. Because this is what we have, right? In the back. The hindmost is how you say it, right? It's in the spinal column, the medulla. And this is a fire of Shekinah. In other words, the fire, the feminine fire of God, which is in the back. Unveiling that or taking the veil of Isis to show you what is that fire by explaining the book of Genesis, which is, of course, the beginning. This is what Isaiah means. Of course, when you meditate and concentrate in all the powers of the Kundalini, the powers of Shekinah, all of those fires that have to develop seven times, seven times in our back, in our spinal column, when you develop that and you meditate in that, and then you understand what the book of Genesis talks about, and with the book of Genesis, with the beginning, you explain what is in the back. And this is how we do it here. The back, <coughs> how do we call it? We call it Hava. Because the goddess of the word, the goddess of the voice, expresses to the hay in the throat. But his power comes from the sexual glands, feminine or masculine sexual glands, and develops in the vav. That is hey, vav, hey, in our back. So the power of the voice, of the expression, of the explanation of the hindmost is through the word, and the power is in the sex, and the yod is the head. So when you say yod, hey, vav, hey, you are talking about the yod, your head, which is always said, the brain is Adam. But when we say the brain is Adam, the head, yod, and then the rest is Eve, which is the power of God. God created the universe. That yod that represents Keter, that yod that represents also the letter Aleph, the Trinity is in the head. Many times we explain that. The word Echad, which means unity, Echad. is written in the first graphic that we place. Let's see the graphic here. Echad is here. See the first graphic of this PDF in the title. And Jehovah Elohim took Eve one of his sides. The word one is written there in between parentheses. Aleph, Chet, Tav, Echad, or Echad. Sometimes it's written with Tav in order to indicate that it is one descending into the very bottom of the tree of life. If you observe the letter Aleph, as we explain, represents the letter Yod three times. Keter Homa Binah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we explained that that Aleph, or the Trinity, with the unknowable divine, is Yehida. Now, the second letter is the letter Chet. 
The letter het, as you see, is the letter that shows two letters. The letter yod and the letter zain. The letter yod is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the letter zain is the seventh. Oh, vav. Yeah, I'm sorry. Vav. Vav is the sixth and zain is the seventh. So the letter Vav, who is the number six, represents Adam, the spinal column. But when we talk about the duality, Vav represents the solar force and Zain represents the lunar force. In other words, the man and the woman. That's why this letter Het always rhymes with the letter He. The letter He it's just the breath coming from your throat. But when you pronounce the other letter, which is het, het, and then you pronounce, you, you see the voice, the logos coming out of your throat. But in order to form the letter het, you have to unite the gap to the top, and then you say het. So the word unity is Echad. Echad. You see the letter Aleph and the two letters. Vav and Zain means man and woman. So when a man and woman are in the sexual act, work, working with his three brains, the three lights that they have, <coughs> they become Echad because the letter Dalet represents the door into Eden. Do you have that uh, video that we made? Sex, the secret door to Eden, to Eden? That door is the letter Dalet, which is exactly in the middle of the word Adam. Adam has also the letter Aleph and letter Mem at the end. Wind and water. But Adam means red earth or red soil. Dalet is Da'at. Adam is he or she who works very hard with the mystery of Gnosis. Da'at. And achieve perfection of the four elements. That's Adam. So Adam is a had as well. Because only when a man is sexually united with a woman, they form a complete unity. The Zohar says, a man by itself, a male by itself, is not a male complete. He needs a home. But who represents home? The woman. That's why the man is very happy when he's inside his home. That means when he's inside his woman. Because he completes the unity. Is one unity. Is one. A had. So the woman without a man is just half of Adam. But when, the, when Adam is working in himself, whether is that Adam within the woman or within the man, is because they are performing their sexual act. Only there is where creation can begin. The creation that we are talking about here, which represents in this case willpower, Moses. That is the son of a priestess, from Levi and a priest from Levi. The two forces united. So that is Ehad. And that's why when you see that Ehad there, you understand why it is written that Adam was made into the image of Elohim. A word that we explain many times. 
is male, female. The word Elohim, translated as God in the Bible, is wrong. Because Elohim doesn't mean God. Elohim means God and Goddess. And it's plural. Mean gods and goddesses. That's the real translation of Elohim. The two polarities. And that's why Adam was made into the image of Elohim. Because Elohim is male-female. And that's why in order to create that Elohim inside of us, we have to, to perform the sexual act. Because only in the sexual act, we are male-female. You can have your wife, or you, as your wife can have your husband, I mean the woman can have a, her husband, in a home, and share the life without sex. So they are not really one until they perform the sexual act. And from that sexual act comes life, whether in the physical plane or internal plane, if you know the way. And that's precisely why it is said that Yahweh him took Eve, one of his sides. Adam, listen carefully, Adam was made by Jehovah Elohim, and we explain the steps. But who is this Eve? Eve represents the Neshama, the feminine soul that is extracting or gathering all of those elements that we gain. Because the male force takes all the forces by fighting. And the feminine force, which is the divine soul, gathers all of that in her, in her home. So in the beginning, of course, this process is of making the transformation or that animal soul into Adam, a human soul, is a long process. But the Bible explains here that Jehovah Elohim, in the seventh day, took Eve, one of his sides. But let us recall and explain how that was that happened. Let us go down into the other graphics. Continuing with uh, what Rabbi Eleazar was asking, who united Adam to all the activities of Israel and Moses? Well, the book of Genesis is the one that unites all of that when we know how to work with the spinal column. With the forces of Eve. Accordingly, said the Zohar, Moses did not die, and so he is called Adam. Of him it is written in the final exile, and for Adam there was not found helpmate, as all were much against him. So in the book of Genesis, explains that when Adam was already inside Eden as a resurrected master, and then to enter into the second step, because the resurrected or the resurrection is in relation with Bina, the Holy Spirit. In order to enter into the world of Chokmah, which is a higher step in what Master Samael calls the mountain of ascension, in which he receives his twin soul. Do you hear? Many people in these uh, moments, in this day and age, are asking about the soulmate. How do I know my soulmate? Well, the real soulmate, you know it at this stage. When you are in the, the fourth dimension, 
with an immortal body. And you see that division in relation with initiation. Here in this physical world, everybody would like to have a soul mate. But remember that uh, what type of souls are we? We are animal souls. We have defects and vices. We have anger, we have lust, we have laziness, gluttony, etc. And we ask, where is my soul mate? And when somebody comes and says, and say, oh, she is so glutton. She is so angry. She is always lustful. Or she is so proud. Whatever. Well, it's your soul mate. Or, or are you an angel? No, right? All of us are devils. We have defects. So our soul mate in this physical plane has to be another one with defects. Oh no, but we say no. If I enter into this path, I need my soul mate. Means a woman, in this case, being a male, with all defects, vices, and errors that will please me all the time and only to do my work. And vice versa, right? Oh, I want to like a prince that will do everything that I ask. My soul mate. But... What type of souls are we? Are we this type of soul that we're explaining here? It's very difficult to understand and comprehend what I'm saying. You know, for you, said, I, it's difficult. Yeah, because we are not there. But the, but the book of Genesis explains about it. And the Zohar explains about it. But the, the ridiculous thing, the ludicrous thing is that many people think that they are that made to the image of God. Perfect. And meanwhile, look at this planet. This is full of vices, nerves, wars. So we are not that man. We are not that Adam. But we can reach that level if we work hard. With, with a soul mate. But remember, your soul mate has to be in the same level that you are. Examine your defects and vices and seeing which level I am, what type of defects and vices do I have, what virtues. So I need another woman, if you are a man, the same level, that you will be your soulmate. So, when the man enters into this level, that soulmate <coughs> that is being made at that level, is coming from the annihilation of defects and vices. Remember, we are full of defects and vices. If we disintegrate that, all of that structure will be absorbed by your feminine soul or your spiritual soul. And that is what we call Neshama or Chava. That eventually will take physical body beside you. That will be your twin soul. But it's a long process. First you have to enter into Eden. Once you are in the fourth dimension, as, a, as a Adam made into the image of God, then God can say, okay, now I can take Eve out. Not before. Had to be perfect. No stains, no defects, no vices. And that's why it is, it is written that when the, in the fourth dimension, Jehovah Elohim was taken from the man that he made, that he formed, all of those elements, he took Hayot HaKadosh, holy animals, that is written. And then Adam start naming them. This is what the book of Genesis says in the seventh day. Adam was naming all the animals, etc. But none of these animals were helpmate for him. Because actually, what Jehovah Elohim took out of Adam was Lilith and Nahemah. Or Lilith and Naama, as we said in, in the Hebrew. The two psychologists that we have within. 
these two psychologies that we have within are related. With a, we're going to show you than there. Let us go very in the very bottom, and you find the male goat of Mendes. This symbol, this graphic of the male goat of Mendes called Baphomet, scared the ignorant, and many ignoramuses play with it, and they don't know what this symbolizes. This creature, as it is represented there, doesn't exist. It's a symbol. Baphomet is his name and is written backwards. Abbas, Pasis, Ominum, Ominium, Templi. Latin, which translated into English means Father of Peace of all men of the Temple. So most of those people that were organized and entering into this uh, order of the temple always face that figure, that image of Baphomet. And they were asked, if you want to enter into our order, you have to go back to that statue and kiss his bottom. If you kiss his baton, you are welcome. And then many were there looking at this, and they said, This is the devil. Right? But they didn't understand that the symbol of the pentagram facing up, upside right, was in the forehead of that male goat. That means as a positive symbol. And for you, maybe it will be strange to hear this, but this is the truth. Symbolizes Christ. But made in such a way to scare the scary cats. When the man that was entering into that order says, I am going to kill his butt, was going back into his back, then a door was open underneath the foundation of that statue and from there a beautiful woman welcomed him into the temple and he was entering into the mysteries I mean he was not that literally he was going to kiss the butt of that statue it's just a procedure of course if you see here when you uh, look in the Bible for the goat, you find Azazel. Azazel is always, you find in the internet, many figures of this, symbolized as a male goat. And this is, it says, this is the devil, Azazel. Azazel is simply Aza and Azael, split in two. Two moons, in other words. Do you see the Baphomet? He is just pointing one moon in the bottom and another moon on the top. And in his arms, you find the word solve et coagule. Of course, the breast of the Baphomet in Hebrew, you said Shada or Shaddai, who is the holy name of God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob followed. Shada means breast, the power of sex, in other words. The feminine force of Shada is in the breast. You, you have to dissolve the two moons and to coagulate the divine soul within with the power of the goat. What is the goat? 
Well, in the zodiacal signs, the gold is Capricorn, symbol of Saturn, symbol of Shabbat. That's why it is called the God of Shabbat. But Shabbat is Jehovah Elohim, Saturn, which is symbolized by Capricorn. But that force of the left side of the tree of life coming from Bina, who is that scapegoat, as a force of fire, escapes from there. It's Nefesh, the animal soul, that escapes down and to go into the physical world. By descending, it descends into Gebura and to Hod, to Yesod, finally Malkut, in our sexual energy. So that goat symbolizes the sexual force. But Aza and Azael means the two moons that we had to conquer. Do you remember that in a previous lecture I told you that Solomon descended to the Garden of Nuts in order to acquire his wisdom? Well, Solomon, his inner name, his sacred name, is Azazel. And in order to become a king, as Solomon, with a lot of wisdom, you had to overcome the two moons. See, in the middle of that image, you find the caduceus of Mercury, symbolized as the phallus of the goat. And that means temple, template. When the fire of the heart, of the breast, of that goat, goes into the sexual organs, then the man receives erection. It says it's templated. His sexual organ is templated in such a way it's hard. And that is the symbol of the phallus there. The two polarities, the two moons. You know? And of course, the feet of the goat, representation of the power of Nefesh. The whole work that we had to do is represented there. We had to rise the forces of sex in order to have the wings of the eagle in the back of our spinal column. That wings of the eagle, if you put the wings of the holy dove of the Holy Spirit, is the same, the same symbol. And that's why on top of the head of that goat, you find a torch with fire, the fire of Pentecost, that you had to develop <coughs> by controlling your animality. That is represented in two moons, Nahema and Lilith, which we explain in other lectures. So, what Jehovah Elohim took from Adam was Lilith and Nahema, his animality, that was not help made for him. Because Adam represents the middle of the tree of life, the spinal medulla, the forces of the fire. And that's why you see there, the symbol is the whole work that we have to perform. You find in the internet, in this day and age, a lot of groups that they say that they worship Baphomet. And they put it there to scare the people. But when you read what they write about Baphomet, they say, these people are just clowns. They don't even know what Baphomet is. They are not working with Baphomet. The people that work with Baphomet are those that do the sacrifices of the goat. One goat for the Lord and another for Azazel, as the Bible says. The two forces had to, had to combine good and evil inside in order to acquire control of, of their own sexuality and to develop the King Solomon inside. Do you remember that we talk about King David? 
Now the Messiah is the son of David and the son of Joseph, who is the stone of Yesod. But in order to David to become Solomon, then the queen of Shiva has to come. The queen of Shiva represents, of course, Hava, Eve, taken out from his own fires. That's why we place this other graphic here, where you find uh, Adam and Eve as fires. And we quote Genesis chapter 2, 21. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Soth shall be called Isha, for whom Ish has Soth been taken. Remember here that when we said Adam, we relate to men. But here in the Bible, when you read, you don't find that Adam is saying, This is now born of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from me. Who is Adam? No, he says that. She was taken from Ish. Who is this Soth? If you see the word there, the first letter of that word is Zain, which is the seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That seventh is precisely the forces of the left that are related with the goat, with Baphomet. The forces of the left, the Zain, that go down, and because our ignorance, because of lack of wisdom, we transform that soft or lunar force into two psychologies that we call Naama and Lilith, which are precisely the animality within that are represented by this uh, god of Mendes, Baphomet. So when the initiate takes from himself, or better say, Better say, because it is not the initiate that does it, but God within the initiate. Because all this work that we are explaining here is done by God inside of us. Sometimes we say the initiate does it, but really, when you work seriously in yourself, the only thing that you have to do is to comprehend your defects and vices. You have to realize and to comprehend that you are a sinful soul. You are Mary Magdalene with seven sins. And that the Lord is inside of you, purifying you, when you comprehend your defects and your vices. Then He, He, not you, He takes the sins out of Mary Magdalene and make of her holy by mingle with her. This is a symbiosis of two souls. And this is precisely why it is written that when Jehovah does that, he says, Adam in the Garden of Eden said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In Kabbalah, the skeletal system, the bones, are represented by Abraham. And the flesh is represented by Geburah, Isaac. Remember that uh, that is Abraham that was going to kill his son, Isaac. And uh, instead of killing him, he says he found a goat to sacrifice. Behold the same symbol there. Instead of killing his son, he finds the goat, mean working with the fire, with esh, which is fire. 
So in other words, when Adam says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, he's referring to Soth. Soth is a Hebrew word that means the fire of the left of the spinal column. Because Zain belongs to the left side of the tree of life where we find the forces of Aleph going down to Tav, which is Malkut. That's Soth. But when that Soth is purified, and then Adam says, Soth is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, meaning that he has extracted, or the Soth has extracted, all the knowledge of good and evil within him. And God has separated that. That's why it says, shall be called Isha, which means Esh, fire, in the feminine aspect, woman. So all that fire that he built through many initiations is separated from him. And that's Isha. Because it's taken from Ish. In other words, Esh, fire, is God. Remember that we said in the lecture, God is a devouring fire. Remember the burning bush? God is fire. And that's why it's written that God is an Esh of war. God is that fire that we developed, and that fire is called Zohar, which explains all the development of the fire in each one of us. So when the man has developed that fire within, means God is within. And that God is called Jehovah Elohim, which is fire. So then God, as fire, developed in the man, is taking the feminine aspect of himself, or we will say it, itself, because if I said him, it means male, but Jehovah or him is not him, is not her, she or him, or he, is both. So he's taking Eve out, and with that Eve is a fire of the Divine Mother, Kundalini. That ear represents Hava, the Divine Mother. That's why the Sohar states, At that initiatic time, Jehovah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Jehovah Elohim alludes to Ava and Ima. And at this sleep, is the exile, as it is written. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And lo, and horror of a great darkness fell upon him. He caused a deep sleep to fall upon Moses, and he slept, and his sleep is an allusion to exile. And this is a good uh, point here. Diaspora. The exile. What is that? That diaspora of exile of Israel begins in Yehida, in the superior world. Because those archetypes descend. That's the first exile from the superior worlds and become down as archetypes. Remember that as archetypes, they go into Malkut. All the process that we explained already. That's the exile or the diaspora that the Bible talks about. Do not, please, confuse exile with exodus. Completely two different things. Exile is the exit of Israel or that soul which has to be developed from the absolute down into the physical world. That's called exile, not exodus. Shemot or exodus 
is from Malkut up. That's another thing. Because many Gnostics confuse exile with exodus. And that's really, Kabbalistically, absurd. Because in the exodus, the soul is getting free from the Pharaoh, from the tyrant. And where is that tyrant in the absolute? In the absolute, there is no tyrant. The absolute is happiness. So it's an exile from happiness. But Exodus is from Malkut. In order to return into the promised land, into Yehira, in other words. So therefore, that is the, exa the, the, the exile. In esoteric terms, we will say, you know, Buddhist terms, or Gnostic terms, exile is renunciation. Because Israel or the soul renounced the happiness of the absolute and is exiled into the physical world. And when the initiate gains nirvana, and then another exile, if he renounces nirvana, gaining nirvana, he decides to renounce nirvana, so he's another exile. So there are many initiates, many Jews in process, that are in exile. But there are souls, initiates. Please understand that esoterically. The last exile, you see, to sleep, is to fall into exile, meaning that you renounce all the powers, all the consciousness that you developed in the superior worlds and descend into the physical world in order to continue your process. And you fall asleep again. Not fall asleep as like in the beginning, but you lose physically that you gain spiritually. You retain that spiritually. But you are in exile and you said in darkness. This is what the Lord says on the cross. Father, Father, why are you forsaking me? Because you are in exile and you have to work more. So the last exile, which is related with Moses coming out of Egypt, relates to the annihilation of Lilith and Naimah. And only to completely return perfect to the bosom of the Father. That is the last exile, or the last renunciation. Because after that, if you renounce and come to help humanity, God is within you. It doesn't matter if you are in hell, but if God is within you, you are happy. But in the different exiles or process of initiation, the initiate goes down in his diaspora, and God abandons him because God doesn't mix with the devil. He has to annihilate the rest of the differences and vices. That's why in the phrase, and he took one of his sides, from whose ribs did he take? Abba and Aima took one out of one of the maidens of the queen. She is the aspect of white fair as the moon. And close up the flesh in his place refers to the flesh about whom it is said, My spirit shall not always remain in Adam, for that he is also flesh. That is spirit that is not always remain with Adam is that precisely superior part of God that is separated. From the male. You see, male, female. And then you see Chava in front of you. And that's why this is Ish. Isha was taken out of Ish. Or the female fire was taken out of the male fire. And this is how Adam appears in the Garden of Eden. In flesh and bone. Physically speaking. With his twin soul. So when they are separated, they are perfect, both. And then they are separated 
because in order to continue doing special works above the tree of life, these two polarities, which are separated, had to unite under the command of God in order to control and to enter into the 10 eon, 11 eon, 12, 13 eon, and to perfect. Because in order to incarnate the superior forces of the Logos, of that that we call God, has to be in perfect union with fires. No Lilith, no Nahemah there. Because in the beginning, we begin with Lilith and Nahemah. All of us here present, we start practicing our sexual magic, transmutation, with Lilith and Nahemah. Why? Because we are adulterers and fornicators. But we are working and fighting. That's why it's very hard in the beginning. But once the two moons are solved et coagulate, are dissolved and coagulate in light, no more problem. And then Adam and Eve are there, the two polarities. And that's why it is written, the man will leave his father and mother and will unite with his wife. At that level, I'm talking about that level. Under the command of, of, of God. And that's why at that level, God said to both of them, from the tree of good and evil, which is a sexual force, you shall not eat. Because the day that you eat as an animal from it, you will die. I mean, the whole thing that we gain with a lot of efforts will be loose if we fall again into the animality. Then Lilith and Nahema will grow again back into the psyche of the initiate. And then when God sees that, he says, oh, you have Lilith and Nahema within your psyche again? That means that you ate from the fruit that I told you you shall not eat. And that is our situation. We had to stop eating from that fruit, meaning learning how to transform. Solve et coagule. This is precisely what that symbol of the Baphomet states. Because Baphomet, or in other words, Abraxas, is the spirit between God in, and the creature. Who is that creature? We are that creature. Evil creatures. So the spirit between God and the creature is Baphomet. The forces of nature within us. That is telling us. Solve et coagule. Dissolve all your animality and coagulate the light within you. And for that, if you are a man, you have to be entered into the temple of God with peace. Peace is keter. That's why you find that beautiful symbol of Baphomet. The Templars were having that. But who are the Templars? The Knights, right? In order to be a Templar, you have to template your sword, means your sexual organ. Because only with a sexual organ templated is how you enter into the mysteries. That's why another symbol of the Lord Christ is the sexual organ in erection, the male organ, and the female organs here. You see, all of this is a symbol of the Lord in the flesh. You understand that? In the flesh. In other words, simple and straight to you. That Baphomet is you. That goat is you. All of that symbols are within you. You had to dissolve all of that by acting with the forces of sexuality there. And when you achieve that completely, Aza and Azael, the lunar forces, become purified. And then Aza and Azael 
becomes or are transformed into Azazel, Solomon, the king. There is a story in the Zohar that when the Divine Mother Shekinah said to the Father, let us make Adam according to our own image, to like our own likeness. And then two angels were there, Asa and Azael, who represent the two moons, two archetypes. It says, why you create, want to create Adam? You know that he is going to sin and he's going to fall. So why to create him? And then the Divine Mother Shekinah said to those archetypes, which are inside of all of us, why do you complain about it? Adam is going to sin and to fall with one woman. But you, it is written. And when the Son of God saw women as beautiful as they were, the daughters of Adam, they took many wives. So you will be worse than him because you will take many wives. In other words, adultery. And of course, this is a great symbol related with the fall of Adam and Eve. That's why in the Zohar states that Lilith was mingled with with Eve and Nahema with Adam, the two forces. Now you understand why Solomon the king was the wisest of all the kings. Because he performed all of this. And of course, Solomon the king was the son of David. But first, David has to appear inside of us, and then Solomon the king. But Solomon the king is the golden king that appears after resurrection. And he is Azazel. In other words, the one that conquered the two moons of Baphomet. Do you have questions? Is it the same uh, symbol as um, Muhammad splitting the moon? Symbol of Muhammad splitting the moon. What I remember about that Quran is that it says that uh, a sign from the end, says Muhammad, will be that the moon will be split in two. Yeah. Of course, Masih Samael Veor explains this is not a physical division of our moon, but this physical division is related with Baphomet, of course. Symbol of the end. We are spending here of the end explaining with the beginning, with Bereshit, right? Of in the initiatic path. But your question is very interesting because in this day and age also the moon is divided in two. Lilith and Nahema, all this humanity are worshipping prostitution in this day and age, which is Nahama, because prostitution is the mother of adultery and, pros and prostitution and fornication. Uh, everywhere, they are worshipping adultery. Whether through polygamy or polyandry, by interpreting the Bible according to their own whim. But also adultery is very common everywhere in this planet Earth. And the other part of the moon, Lilith who is the most degenerated type of people that exist in this planet that are related with homosexuality and lesbianism and other type of sexual degeneration. That also is part of the moon. And humanity are sinking to the end, to the final annihilation, to dissolve, but not like initiates but to dissolve into hell. Some people are entering and following Nahema. Others 
are following Lilith. You see now that in this planet, everything is really surfacing. Those two moons, those two halves. People are identified sometimes with adultery and fornication or prostitution, and others with homosexuality or lesbianism. We, the Gnostics, we had to renounce that. We had to avoid that. And for that, we had to follow the initiatic path. Mohammed explains that very clear, of course, in his own words. Yeah, the question is about this uh, celibacy, that people claim that they have those uh, polarities within and that they have to work within themselves. But honestly, honestly, if those people celibate, honestly see themselves, not that we are going to tell them, if you honestly see yourself, what type of duality you have in your psyche, do you have Lilith and Nahema, the two moons inside of you? If you discover that, you are just cheating yourself, thinking that you are going to unite the two polarities of God with, by rejection of the opposite sex. Remember, the unity, Yehida, of God is made in the flesh. It is written, Yehida reflects in Nefesh. Nefesh acts in us through the flesh through our bones. So when a man and a woman are sexually united, their nefesh are one. Two goats there. Two goats united. Two nefesh, two animal souls, which are reflecting the light of Yehira. And then they work. This is how they work. Because they have to be born again. They have to die in their defects. The transformation happens only in a unity. But to think that we are going to do it without being a unity, just in celibacy, just as a monk, of, as a nun, well, you can advance in, as a single person, as a certain limit in the work of your psychology. But if you want to enter into the work of Genesis, Exodus, you have to have your other half, physically speaking. If you're a man, you need a woman. If you're a woman, you need a man. And if you want to find your true soulmate, well, if you're a man, your woman also needs to find his own soulmate. That's why men and women in marriages in this day and age, they fight a lot. Why they fight? Because they are soulmates. Both of them have anger. Otherwise, there is no other answer, right? Your question? Oh, you're talking about the yew tree. The actual yew tree. But yeah. the fruit you can eat, but not the seed, just the red part, the blood. But then the leaf, the green part, if you eat it, you die. The tree of life and death. Yeah, the yew tree, uh, which is a symbol of uh, the Nordic uh, literature, yeah, it's a symbol of good and evil too. But really, uh, the true uh, uh, tree that k killed us is uh, the tree of good and evil, which is our own sexuality. You know, if you utilize your sexual force wisely, then you can uh, uh, annihilate your ego, to dissolve your ego and to coagulate and to reach the level of Solomon. Solomon, a solely man or a solar man, that type of that level is in the fourth dimension. Of course, King Solomon physically existed. And he was the expression of that. But remember that he, Solomon the king, 
the individual, the king, that existed, he fell. He's fallen. That Bodhisattva is fallen. But that's another topic here. We're talking here as a, in Azael, in the symbol of the Zohar. Question here? For the what? Is meeting me face to face like white stages of alchemy? The white, of course. The white stage, the purity. Okay. Here's the next question. A Chinese Taoist book, The Secret of the Golden Flower. Is this book explaining the same process? Taoism explain all the process that we are explaining here in their own words, of course. Remember, all religions, Taoism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrism, and all the religions that has existed and existed in the world say the same thing in their own words. Because the founders of those religions are soldiers of Yehida, and they came in order to teach that according to their own level. When you enter into initiation and you develop that light within you, and then with that light you understand what they wrought. But for that you have to study the culture, the language of those people. In order to understand, because every single word relates to the forces of nature. Like we are doing here with the book of Genesis and the Zohar. We are touching the Hebrew language. Because the Zohar is written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The Bible as well. So we have to go into that language in order to explain. But if we go in the, to explain the Zohar, I mean the, the Quran, then we have to study Arabic. Because it is written in that level. As well, if you we want to study Taoism, it's good if we study also the language of Taoism. Which there are many translations now, but you know, most of the people that translate those books are not initiates. Like there is a book, for instance, there, uh, that is called the Bhagavad Gita as it is. And I read it and say, well, as it is What? According to this intellectual from India, right? And he explains according to him, but he is not an initiate, he's a monk. So, where is the fire that will awake the senses in order to understand the Bhagavad Gita? An initiate, like the Master Samael, that walk all the senses, can explain that. And that's why the Master took the Bhagavad Gita, took the Bible, took from many books. Why? Because his mission is to explain, to unveil what is veil. And we are helping him, of course, in this work. But he is the one that unveils everything. Because he is the light of Yehida as well. So any master of Yehida will see that and publish his books. Even if they, after that they call it plagiarist. The ignoramuses. Any other question? Hmm? Here? Yeah? So, the scapegoat, if I remember, the sin went off to Basil, and it's supposed to take your sins away, or when you commit a sin, you send off your goat, and you have one for the Lord. The two goats mean taking your sins away is to dissolve the uh, two moons that would be your sins being taken away by the Exactly. The two goats, uh, according to the Bible, they say that in order to make a sacrifice, you have to have two goats. You put one goat and it goes into the wilderness. It's from Azazel. And the other is for the Lord. How do you understand that? Of course, many Kabbalists give many explanations about that. But if you are working in yourself, in the transmutation of the sexual energy, you understand that Yod Chava Elohim Bina is the left column represented by Saturn, who is the, the goat. And descends down 
into Hod, but from Geburah into Hod and into Yesod, and finally Malkut. That's the Azazel, because Azazel belongs to Hod and Yesod, the two psychologies that we have. In order to understand that, it is easy. You penetrate the woman in the sexual act, your wife, your, your priestess, and you work with your own goat. In the moment where you are doing that because you have ego within, obviously one part of that goat goes to Azazel. Because you have Azazel within, Azza and, Az and Azael. But if you continue your work, the rest will go up to Bina. This is the two goats, the two fires. When you are asking for elimination of your ego, Azazel is present there. Because I would like to find an initiate that penetrates his wife or the wife that receives his man without Azazel being present there. Aza and Azael, Lilith and Ahemar, they're present. That will be very good and a miracle if in the moment that we perform the sexual act, the two psychologists will be out. Or say, God will say, okay, this, take this psychologist out of you now, practice. Everybody would like to have that, right? No. The two psychologists will be with you in the sexual act from the beginning until you annihilate them. So whether you like it or not, you deliver the fire of the goat to Asa and Asael, and to the Lord at the same time. But you comprehend one ego, one defect, that belongs to any of these two moons, and the Lord destroys that and forgives you. That is precisely to receive forgiveness. It's a work of alchemy. It's a work of that knowledge. In order to become... Of Solomon the king. Yeah. What is the difference between the sheep and the goat in the Bible? The sheep and the goat in the Bible, what is the difference? Well, an animal. The oh. The sheep and the goat in the Bible. <coughs> in Matthew. No, I remember that very well. This is the time of the end, uh, the Lord, uh, the Son of Man will come, esoterically speaking here, and we separate the goats from the sheep. Well, the sheep, the ram, symbol of Arius, the head. And the goat, as you know, symbol of the sexual force, nefesh, down in the sex. To separate the two forces, of course, the sheep will be in heaven, in your head, and the goat in hell, in your sod, the nice sphere. That is esoterically speaking, but also refers to those people that fornicate, that worship Asa and Azael, Lilith and Nahema. They will be separated and sent to be dissolved in hell. And it's good to remember here that this dissolution of the ego in hell is not eternal, as many think is made in the eternal dimension, but it has a beginning and an end. There will be dissolved those people that are following the two moons. But those that are working in this path will transform their goat into sheep. They will be meek sheep. So what is a, a lamb? A lamb is the, the son of a ram. He's like a kid. Is a son of a goat. And that's why it's not, uh, a, how you say, uh, a coincidence that we call our children kids. Right? He says, This is my kid. My kids. You know why? Because we are goats. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. 
You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,